Hi everybody, it's your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing our seventh unit on natural selection in this AP Biology class by continuing with topic 7.6, which is on the evidence of evolution. So one of the main points that we drove home at the beginning of the unit was that evolution is a theory, right? It's able to explain a lot of things that we see in biology, almost everything that we see in biology. Nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. Um, so evolution is a really, 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 really strong theory in that it's able to explain a lot and that it's backed up by a lot of evidence. And that's what we're going to get into in the video today. Um, how do we know evidence or excuse me, evolution is it's right. It's fact. How do we know that? Um, so we're going to talk about scientific evidence from five different disciplines, ge geographical, geological, physical, biochemical, and even, yes, mathematical indications that evolution is actually a thing. Um, so we got some hints as to what some of the forms of evidence are going to look like in these two photos here. So let's get into it. Um, well, let's talk about Darwin first. Okay, so Darwin's the, the guy that developed, he wrote the book on evolution by natural selection, right? So he was the one that, you know, is most well credited for the idea that species come from other species. Species change over time. And this is why species change over time, because of natural selection, which we don't have to get into again, because we did several times already. Um, but how did he come up with these ideas? Well, the main thing Darwin studied, in addition to biogeography, which we'll talk about later, where organisms live and why, is by studying fossils, the fossil record. And, um, and we might already know that fossils are the remains or traces of organisms from the past. Okay, so there's one thing about studying organisms that have already, you know, that are extinct, that are dead, um, but where they're located is often a really big thing too. Um, so where you can find fossils, well-preserved fossils, there's a whole thing in that needs to happen in order to make a fossil that's actually worth studying. Um, but you can find fossils in strata, or a singular stratum. Um, and strata are rock layers made by sediment settling, then com being compressed over millions of years. Okay, so it's a special kind of sedimentary rock um, that forms layers, and these layers can be distinguished from each other um, from natural occurrences that may have occurred, like, say, like, you know, a mass extinction event or some other um, change that happens over maybe a thousand years or so that can cause a difference in the rock layers here. So here's the thing. Um, if we picture these layers of rock, younger fossils are going to appear more towards the surface in the upper layers and older ones are going to be deeper. And the way that these fossils are located or layered can really tell us a story of how species have changed over time. Okay, so uh, something that Darwin and other paleontologists were studying um, early on in the, what would that be, the 19th century, um, they found that organisms in deeper layers, in deeper strata, were more dissimilar to extant species, right? So the deeper you go down in these rock layers, and here's an example over here, you can see there's distinct layers of rock. Um, so the organisms in the deeper layers were going to be more different than the ones that you would see in the upper layers or even like on the surface existing, you know, still existing and being alive today, okay? But the further you went up in these rock layers, the more similar they became to today's extant, that means just not extinct, um, species, which gives us a picture like, okay, maybe, you know, organisms change over time and over millions and millions and millions and millions of years, they eventually developed into the organisms that we see today, the species that we see today. Um, new species appeared in rock layers above others after the others went extinct. Okay, so the, the oldest, most extinct ones, they're, I guess they're all equally extinct. Once you're extinct, you're just extinct. Um, but the, the oldest extinct species would be down at the bottom, and they'd be different from the ones that were up on the surface. That gives a pretty good indication that, yeah, um, I think, you know, these ones at the bottom are the ancestors, perhaps, of the ones that appeared above and the ones that uh, exist today, okay? So something that we can find from studying rock strata are the relative age. You can sequence fossils based on their location in these rock layers. Um, 
So like, you know, the bottom ones are the oldest and the ones towards the surface are the youngest, right? But you can find the absolute age, the specific age of rocks using a uh, process called radiometric dating. Okay, so we can use radiometric dating. That's a tool that we can use um, to figure out the absolute age. And how do we do that? Well, every single fossil has what we call radioactive isotopes. Okay, and radioactive isotopes decay at a constant rate that can be used to figure out how old a fossil is. Okay, so an isotope, if you uh, know this from maybe some kind of physical science or uh, physics or chemistry class, um, isotope is an atom that has more neutrons than a normal atom does, right? Okay, so here's our example that we're going to be talking about the most. Carbon-14. Okay, carbon, as we might know, carbon has, I'm going to try and write this out, six protons, six protons, and normally six neutrons, right? It has six neutrons and six protons. Carbon-14, okay, as the number 14 suggests, does not have six neutrons, but six plus eight is 14. So it has eight neutrons and six protons. Okay, so an atom like this with some extra neutrons in it, it's an isotope. And some isotopes are radioactive, which means they're very unstable and they'll eventually decay or become another type of atom that is more stable. Okay, and the time that it takes for half of a uh, parent isotope to decay it's called its half-life, okay? So if I have a fossil, all right, and I measure how much carbon-14 it has, okay, I can determine how old it is based on the fact that I know that, okay, I have a sample of carbon-14, it's going to decay in 5,730 years. All right, that's called its half-life, okay? So here's a, here's a picture of just a general um, radioactive decay graph here. Okay, so if I have a bunch of carbon-14, I have I have a sample from an organism that recently died, it has all of its carbon-14. Okay, if it only has half of it left, okay, if it only has half the carbon-14 left that it, that it used to, I can tell that it's 5,730 years old. If it has only 25%, I can tell you that it's gone under two half-lives, which would be 11,460 years old. Okay, um, so that's a way, uh, we're not necessarily going to be doing calculations on this, but that's another really, really good way that we can find out um, the age of fossils, okay? And you, combining the relative age and the absolute age, we can see how organisms have changed over time. That is a huge piece of evidence um, when it comes to showing that, yeah, evolution is actually a thing. All right, and the other, uh, the other main source of evidence that, that Darwin had for his, uh, for his development of theory of, bi of evolution by natural selection is biogeography. It's the study of the geographic distribution of species. Where do they live and why? Okay, so uh, the two twin theories of biological evolution and also continental drift, we can use that to predict what kind of, where kinds of fossils and organ, where we can find kinds of fossils and organisms. Uh, hold on. Where, yeah, are found. There we go. That's better. Um, but yeah, so... As we may know, all of our continents, all of our seven, and some geologists may argue eight continents um, that we can find today, were all combined into one large landmass about 250 million years ago. It's called Pan Pangaea, right? Um, so based on our knowledge of plate tectonics and continental drift, as well as by evolution, we can figure out like, oh, yeah, um, these species evolved near each other, which means that they probably have a common ancestor and they s evolved from the same species. Okay, you, can find, uh, you can find species of plants on the eastern coast of South America. In the same, you can find the same fossils on the western coast of Africa. What does that suggest? Well, they're put together and they evolve from the same species. Okay, so those twin concepts are really, really important in showing that evolution is a real thing. Okay, in order to even further that point, okay, before I get into that, but it's uh, similar organisms live by each other and in similar environments. Um, and to prove that point here, marsupials. Marsupials are mammals that grow their young in a pouch and not as opposed to a placental, um, which, uh, which grows their young you know, inside with, and is uh, supported with a placenta. Um, marsupials are endemic to Australia. Okay, you can find other marsupials like possums, 
around the world now because of uh, human intervention, you know, bringing them from one place to another. Maybe they're like an introduced species, but marsupials are endemic to Australia, meaning that they, you can't find them anywhere else in the world other than in Australia, okay? That suggests that, okay, all marsupials have a common ancestor that developed completely separate from the rest of the mammals of the world, okay? So this particular environment in Australia, being separated out and being isolated out from all the other continents, produced these marsupials, this whole class of, uh, of mammals, okay? So all of these marsupials that exist in Australia, they have a common ancestor that was separated out from the rest of the continents, okay? So the fact that, um, and we can draw a line, it's actually called a, the Wallace line, that you can separate out where marsupials grew up from where placentals grew up um, throughout the Indo Indonesian archipelago. Right? It's pretty it's pretty darn good uh, evidence, okay? Um, here's some more, in fact. Similarities among organisms support evolution. Um, and I'm going to introduce this word to you, homology, similarity resulting from common ancestry. Many, many species of animals and plants have homology um, in that they have very, very similar structures at several different points in their life um, that suggest that they came from a common ancestor. Okay, so uh, there's better examples of this um, too, but this is what I found um, based on my internet search here. Um, but here's embryos about the same like some kind of similar point in development for a chick so like a like a chicken and uh in a person okay look at these are the these are the embryos shortly after uh shortly after fertilization here um they look pretty similar right they they have giant heads they both have tails okay and they both have what are called pharyngeal slits and pharyngeal arches okay so they so they have, what? Think about that for a second. They both have gill slits? What? Yeah, it's true. Like every single person as a embryo had gill slits at one point or another, okay? Before, it, before your, the rest of your respiratory system developed into lungs. Um, and so that suggests just the fact that, you know, you have gills at some point in the, your, your development, that is a huge uh, proponent of evolution as well. Okay, but take a look how similar they are. They both have tails. They both have gill slits. Okay, that suggests that, you know, chickens and people have a common ancestor. Okay, I'm going to extend that further and say that all life has a common ancestor. Okay, but we can definitely see that these have a common ancestor based on the way that they develop. Okay, so that's called homology. Okay, and uh, to extend that even further, there exists some structures. Well, they're called homologous structures, structures that represent variations on a theme present in a common ancestor. Okay, so uh, just to show you more evidence that all vertebrates are related to one another, um, here's the forelimbs of four different animals. Okay, here's our uh, here's our human. Uh, we got humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. Okay, that that's your forelimb. Hello, there's your arm. Um, all four of these animals that are kind of different from one another, like here, here's a human, here's a dog, here's a bird, here's a whale, um, they all have the same bones. They all have the same structures. Take a look at the dog. Uh, humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpal, phalanges. Here's the bird. Same thing. Here's a whale. Same thing. Okay. All four of these, but th think about this. We use our arms to grab things and manipulate the world around us. Dogs use theirs for running. Birds use theirs for flying. And whales use theirs for swimming. Why do they all have the same bones? Well, it's all because they evolved from the same common ancestor. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, so as I said, the forelimbs of various animals contain the same bone patterns, the same bones, but they all have different functions, suggesting that they all developed from the same common ancestor. Okay, um, a little bit more on the on the whales though. Okay, think about this: a whale has flippers. Okay, why does it need fingers? It's not going to grab anything, right? It has finger bones though. Okay, that's because well, you know, whales once developed from an animal that lived on land. They have a common ancestor. All cetaceans, uh, whales, dolphins, have a common ancestor that that lived on land. Okay, that's why they still have fingers, and that's why they still have hips as well. They still have leg bones as well. Those are called vestigial structures, remnants of features that serve to function in an organism's ancestors. They inherit these useless structures from an older species, from an, from an ancestor, 
okay? So whales, dolphins, and other, you know, cetaceans, they have finger bones. They have hip bones. They don't use them, but they still have them because they evolved from a older, older species that lived on land, okay? You have vestigial structures as well. You have a tailbone, okay? Just the fact that we call it a tailbone is indicative of evolution, right? I'm not saying that, oh, people had tails once. Like, no, humans evolved from a species that once did have tails, all right? Uh, so that's what I want to say about that. Uh, wisdom teeth are another uh, vestigial structure. Male nipples are another vestigial structure. Uh, your appendix, to some extent, is a vestigial structure. Okay? We have them, but they're useless. Why do we have them? We evolved from a common ancestor. All right, one of the last points I want to make here is that similarities in nucleotide and amino acid sequences also provide evidence for common ancestry. All the stuff that we've talked about so far, you know, Darwin didn't have access to genomic databases now. Okay? But we have all this information now. All the stuff that we talked about in the last two units only goes to further support evolution. 98% um, of the genome shared is shared between chimpanzees and, and uh, humans. And they're our closest common, and they're, they're our closest cousins. You know, we share the most re recent common ancestor with chimpanzees when it comes to extant species. That's because we have 98% of our genome is exactly the same. You are 98% chimpanzee in some extent. Not really. That's, I don't really like when people say that, but, uh, but that's a whole other thing. All right, um, all organisms share some DNA, even bacteria and humans. All living things have some shared DNA, have some shared genes. It's amazing. Okay? That goes to further show that all life is related to one another. All right, and finally, last piece is that evolution is directly observed. Okay, one argument against evolution is that, oh, you can't see it happening, it happens too slow, there's no way that we can know. But yeah, we can, actually, and it's a really, really big problem. Um, antibiotic and pesticide resistance, which we've talked about in the past, have evolved in recent years in response to, to humans. Okay, so here's my, my picture of uh, um, pesticide resistance. Okay, natural selection happening right here in this picture. Okay, after several generations of pesticide applications, these... Um, these, these insects become more adapted and that's evolution, okay? They changed over time. Hey, this, uh, and another point I want to make is that species have changed in response to other introduced species. Hey, I forget the name of this bug. Um, I'm going to have to look it up. I'll maybe put it in the description or something like that, okay? But, uh, this bug, okay, the, after it was native, it was endemic to, um, one particular Pacific island, specific specific Pacific island um, that had a very particular species of flower there, okay? Once new flowers were introduced, this species changed in order to, uh, in order to accommodate for the new introduced species of flower that was brought by humans to that island. All right. Um, so yeah, that is it. That is it for this video. I know it was a long one. Please let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you next time.